Hi, good evening. This is Steve Podrachik and John Rudder tonight giving you a presentation about advanced flight planning. What we're going to do today is a little bit different. Uh, for the web, If you've watched any of the uh, webinars we've done this week, we've spent all the time on the iPad. On this one, since it's advanced uh, flight planning, we're going to take advantage of the fact that FlyQ exists both as the iPad version and the iPhone version, but also it's FlyQ Online, which is our web-based flight planner. So we're going to go to our web-based flight planner to begin the presentation and then show how to transition over to FlyQ on EFB. So I'm logging in right now to our web-based flight planner. All right. So the way I'm going to, you can't see something, but I just move something out of the way so I can see it. All right. So the way that FlyQ Online works, uh, this works on a Mac or a PC. I'm doing this on a Mac today just because I happen to be using a Mac. Equally good, though, um, using whatever web browser you use. The point behind this is that you can do very, very detailed flight planning with FlyQ Online today, which actually does a fairly good job of mirroring what you're going to see on FlyQ EFB 4.5 in two days. What am I talking about? Okay, this is an uh, this is an advanced flight planning class, so I'm going to show some somewhat advanced things. The first thing they want to do though is just to create a flight plan. So one of the things that FlyQ Online and FlyQ EFB can do is if you're playing an IFR flight. By the way, for a lot of this demo, we're going to assume IFR flights. In most of the other ones, we've assumed VFR flying. Um, we figure since this is an advanced class, it's a good time to take advantage of IFR. So what we're going to do is to do a quick flight plan from the Seattle area over to Minneapolis, St. Paul. So I'm going to go in the search box and type in SEA. Ah, as you can see, it already did it. Uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Then I'm typing the letter I. Now you may wonder what does that mean? In FlyQ EFB and on FlyQ Online, you can put a one letter suffix on the end of a flight plan. Typically it's V, for example, for victors. That one um, letter suffix tells the system how to route it. So by default, if you were just to type in SEA MSP, it will use whatever default routing method, altitude, aircraft, uh, pilot, whatever you've set up for yourself to do the routing. But you can also force a particular routing. So if you by default uh, have your routing set to be point to point, but you want to go on Victor Airways, you can type a V. That will force that one flight plan to be on Victor's. If you're lucky enough to fly a jet, Instead of a V, you can put the letter J to route it on jets. If your default flight plan, on the other hand, is maybe Victor's, and you just want to go literally point to point with no routing, you can type N, meaning no routing. So that'd just be a straight line, two points, Seattle to Minneapolis, St. Paul. One that you may not, you pr may know those. One that you may not be familiar with um, has been ex has existed since FlyQ 3. Point something, and that's the letter I. That means even if I have a VFR flight plan uh, set as my default, plan this one on IFR, and also look for recently cleared uh, ATC routes. So I'm going to do SEA MSP, hit the enter key or the return key rather on my iPad. It tells you to look for the routes. And here they are. Now, in this particular case, we're cheating a little bit because we're flying, John is flying a Bonanza. And if you take a look at the maximum and minimum cleared altitudes here, it's pretty clear that no Bonanza flies at 39,000 feet. But this is just for the point of a demo. If I tap on, these are all the recently cleared routes sorted at the top from ones cleared by ATC less than an hour ago. Then as I scroll down, I'm gonna scroll down quickly. You see some that are 16 hours ago and so on. As you select the cell for each of those choices, it highlights the route in blue. FlyQ EFB does this as well. It looks a little bit different. It looks a little better than FlyQ EFB, but the concept is the same. So let's say that I want that particular route. This is a, a route which, again, is clearly made for a plane that can fly higher than John's Bonanza, but close enough. You get a number of bits of detail about this. In addition to the routing info, it tells you how many times it's been approved recently and the last time it was uh, approved, which in this case was two days ago. It gives you the total distance, the estimated duration, and the estimated fuel burn based on your default plane. It also tells you the minimum and maximum um, altitudes that it was uh, done at. However, you can override that a little bit. This is a neat feature of the product. You don't have to take exactly the route that they gave you. You can modify it a little bit. So in both FlyQ EFB and in FlyQ Online here, you can tell it, well, I want to use this route. So you can see my mouse is hovering over that middle button there, but I want it to be wind optimized. 
And uh, for a Bonanza, I'm probably going to need a fuel stop. So hit the checkbox that says add fuel stop. You don't have to accept these, by the way. If you go up to the top of it, there's a uh, some white text that says create a new route. So you can ignore these and just create one from scratch, but probably better to take uh, one of these. So at this point, I'm moving my mouse down to the part that says use route, click there, and the system will create the flight plan by taking the points that were supplied in the recently cleared ATC flight plan, but wind optimizing them and trimming them also, by the way, to the maximum altitudes that the Bonanza can be at. So now if you take a look at the flight plan, there it is. The entire plan is there. Notice it did need a fuel stop, so it added a fuel stop based on the lowest price, not just because it was the closest airport, but added the lowest fuel price uh, for six Victor or five over here. You can see it's marked as a stop. You can also see that in that particular case, it added 25.2 gallons. So now you can see the flight plan on the screen. We can do a little bit better than that though. If we go to our layers pop-up, which is the same icon as the layers in FlyQ EFB, if you go down to the, on the left-hand side, you go down to other, at the bottom is profile. With the profile view, we can now take a look at the profile of the aircraft and we can take a look at how weather may affect our flight. So for example, let's turn on the static radar images for radar and maybe the METAR docs. So turn uh, the METARs on too, but take it a second to do that. There we go, okay. So all the METAR dots are there. Now, if you take a look at the timeline and this, I'm gonna make uh, the screen a little bit bigger for a second. Okay, so the, the numbers overlap, but I want you to be able to see the dots a little bit more clearly. So everything's nice and big. I'm gonna bring this back down to normal size. And if you take a look at the flight plan line down here, most of the bar on the plan itself is white, except for an area near where I'm holding my mouse right now. There's a green line. What does that mean? The green line is the part where we're actually in flight. So if I were to take my timeline and I point it to someplace there, see what just happened? I selected about 8.30 tonight, and on the top map view, it put the aircraft icon where it would be mid-flight at that point, and on the profile view at the bottom, it showed me where I'm going to be there as well. So this is a good example of where how you can plan a flight on FlyQ Online, and in terms of how you can modify the flight, because one of the things I want to look at was there are some weather patterns here, so maybe I want to avoid them just a little bit. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to zoom the map in a little, so I can see this a little bit more. There's a map zoom feature built into it, of course. And this is an IFR flight. So let's set my base map to being IFR. I'll close that. And notice that there's some radar echoes here. Maybe I want to avoid those. So what I can do is I can drag my flight plan line, maybe drag it down to here instead. The system will look for the points that are in that vicinity. Oop, I just clicked on actually, probably don't wanna do that. You can avoid it here. And we'll fly to a fix that's in that area. So I tap on my fix tab, select a particular fix, and then you'll see the flight plan in a moment will get loaded to the new location. That got changed automatically on the nav log. You probably didn't notice it, but I think this is it, uh, Kixco, or Choco rather. Uh, the Choco point here is the one that just got added and that helped us um, get around a lot of the bad weather. One thing I do want to point out that's pretty slick that FlyQ Online can do. If you take a look at the entry in the nav log for 6 Victor 5, you notice that we're flying at 19,000 feet. It's putting in 60.8 gallons of fuel. That is blue and underlined in FlyQ Online and on FlyQ EFB. If it's blue, it means you can click on it. So I just clicked on this, and FlyQ can automatically do something pretty slick. Uh, FlyQ EFB cannot quite do this yet, but, EF, but uh, FlyQ Online can. When you put in the fuel, you can tell it to uh, top off the tanks, you can add in a specific amount of fuel, or the default is to fill to takeoff level. That's pretty slick because what it means is it will actually keep it at that level. So if I were to modify my flight plan to either take more fuel or less fuel because I make the flight longer or shorter, you'd find that the amount of fuel added at that stop, I'm just gonna hit cancel now, the amount of fuel added at that stop would dynamically adjust to map to the new flight plan. All right, so that gives you some sense of what you can do in FlyQ Online. There's some other weather layers uh, that are pretty interesting too. So I'm gonna zoom in. In fact, let's, I'm gonna click on that airport 6V5, hit the map button to zoom the map to it. Maybe that 
a little bit too tight, but maybe not. So let's take a look at some of the other map layers that are available here. So I'm going to tell it to turn on ceilings. There'll be various icons that give me a sense of what the ceilings in the area are like. Visibility, precip, maybe I'll pick a different airport. That one looks like it's too small to have its own readings. So I'll go back to move the map back to SeaTac. Okay, uh, sky conditions and maybe surface winds. It can be a little busy just because there's so many airports in that vicinity, but let's get rid of the pop-up here. And notice what you see. In fact, let's go to maybe a little bit different airport. It's not in our flight plan, but it'll just be a little bit more visually clear. So I'll go to maybe Arlington, be a decent example. So at the Arlington airport, you see it right here. My cursor is hovering in the middle of the airport. Uh, there's an eye symbol with 10 plus, so the visibility is 10 plus. There's a wind arrow in yellow pointing to the southeast at 10, so 10 knots, and sky conditions are clear. And the overcast bubble here means that is uh, broken, that is scattered clouds. So all of that information is available there by tapping on the new weather layers and so on. There's a lot more that you can do too. For example, you can display pyreps, you can display air mats and sig mats, uh, winds aloft. I just show those last things. Uh, the winds aloft and the pyreps. I'm going to turn off some of these smaller layers though, just because they'll get a little bit visually noisy and then move the map back out a little bit. I'll show you what I mean. So as we zoom the map back out, the little dots on here are actually, I left on the surface winds. So this gives you a sense just based on color. It can't, the color means it's a light uh, surface wind. So you see arrows that mean surface winds and so on. I'm going to turn those off to declutter it. So go to my surface winds and turn that off. Now we have a pretty clean display. The icons in FlyQ EFB look different than this, uh, the new ones that you'll see in two days. But for FlyQ Online, the symbol that kind of looks like a guy with sunglasses and headphones and a microphone means that there's a pyre up there. If you click on it, it shows you about that. And FlyQ EFB 4.5, uh, we use more standard uh, sim symbology. So turbulence and icing use the symbols that you would expect. The other thing though to mention is Again, and you'll see this in FlyQ Online EFB, uh, sorry, FlyQ EFB in two days. There's an altitude slider. So if you take a look at the winds, those are all the green and orange arrows. Right now we're at about 6,000 feet. I'm gonna click on 9,000. I'm gonna click on 12,000 feet and maybe all the way to say 30,000 feet. And you see that the colors have really started to change. Let me zoom out a little bit on here. And you see really nice, a pattern, it's pretty clear to tell how the winds are going as you change the altitudes. So we have a lot, I'm gonna actually turn off even some other layers. Let's turn the METARs off and the PIREPS and just focus on the winds here for a second. Now, of course, winds um, have a lot to do with what time it is, not just the altitude. So in FlyQ EFB 4.5 and in FlyQ Online today, you can move the uh, altitude slider and the time slider. So I'm gonna leave the winds at 12,000 feet on the altitude slider, but move the timeline forward by a few hours. Notice that the winds changed like that. So now we're at 4 a.m. and so on. When I move it backwards to maybe like nine o'clock tonight, the winds have changed. So the point here is that you have what in FlyQ Online, when we introduced this feature, we call this four dimensional weather because you're looking at horizontal and vertical, you're looking at altitude and you're looking at time, the four basic dimensions. So that is what some of the weather and flight planning looks like in FlyQ Online. Um, FlyQ EFB 4.5 will have a lot of the same features. But the point about this is to talk about advanced flight planning. So at this point, I'm going to turn over the presentation to John Rutter, who will be doing this on an iPad. You're up. Great. Okay. Hello, everybody. John Rutter here, Seattle Avionics. Uh, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do a little bit more on advanced flight planning um, on the iPad. So, first of all, let me make sure you guys are seeing what I'm seeing. I'm going to go ahead and tap on the FlyQ EFB icon, of course, just to pop it up. Looks like it's working well, and I, I have a little reflective screen that shows me what you guys see, and so it looks like it's working well. Um, so, um, Steve had done the flight plan in FlyQ Online um, using what we call the quick flight planning strip. That's the little uh, white box that says 
um, that says search for airports in the upper left hand corner. Now you notice that uh, that was there on FlightQ Online and of course it's also here on FlightQ EFB on your iPhone or iPad. And so the quickest way to create a flight plan, of course, is just typing right in that quick flight planning strip. I won't review that you can, um, you know, that if you just put in your takeoff from airport and your landing airport where you're headed to, um, then it will use the preferences that you already have set up. And of course, where do you find your preferences? If uh, um, on, in the horizontal black bar at the top here, where that search for airports uh, little dialog box is, there's a white gear wheel, which is the FlyQ EFB settings. Now, this is an advanced class, so I'm going to presume that you know a fair amount about FlyQ EFB. If you go and click to your settings, then you can scroll down. You can go ahead and go to your flight planning. You can go to your defaults under flight planning, which is the fourth one down. And this will has the max altitude, which is usually tied to your aircraft. It has the kind of uh, default routing method you like for your auto router. Um, it has how far in the future from when you're creating your plan is your takeoff going to be. And mine I've set not the default of an hour that comes in flight QEFB, but I've set it for two hours, so I have more time. Um, I have an average layover time of 45 minutes, but I could, of course, tap on any of these and change any of them. I don't have any minimum altitude or minimum cruise altitude or anything like that uh, set. If you look down at the bottom, you can see that I do like to optimize for best winds. And what that means is that for every leg of your flight, FlyQ, whether it's EFB or online, um, or actually FlyQ Pocket or FlyQ Insight, are versions that also run on the Android phone and iPhone. Um, if you optimize for best winds, then when it does your routing, it's going to have looked at, downloaded all the winds for a 200 nautical mile path along your flight path. And it's going to pick the cardinally corrected, of course, altitude between ground level or AGL and the service sailing of your aircraft that is the altitude that will get you there the most quickly. So um, my point of view is why not opt always optimize for best winds uh, now, if you're flying a turbine or something or, or a jet and you're going up and you're always going to go to your service ceiling or something close to it, then that's a kind of a different deal. But for most of us flying GA aircraft at, you know, 18, 19,000 feet and below, um, optimizing for best winds on average, we, uh, we've done a lot of testing, of course, and done millions of flight plans over the years. And uh, our average shows that we can save you between 15 and 20 minutes on an average three and a half hour leg. Uh, on a cross country by that wind optimizer. So why not go ahead and uh, you know use the wind optimizer? And then of course you can always override or get rid of the uh, the ups and downs because sometimes it'll say take off, level off at 6,500 feet, fly for your first 30 miles, and then when you hit a waypoint and you're turning on a Victor Airway, it may say now with that little bit of 15 uh, degree turn and different altitude of terrain you're flying over, your best um, wind optimized altitude may have gone from 6,500 up to 9,500 or 8,500. So, um, but you can always override those, of course. Uh, you can see the other things I have uh, d um, selected as defaults, and of course you can change any of those that you want to. So, um, when you use the quick flight planning strip in the upper left hand corner, it's going to apply all of your defaults that are in your settings unless you override them with the little one letter identifier. Steve talked about how you can put a V for if you wanna, let's say my default was GPS direct or point to point, you could go ahead and override it by just putting in that I wanna go from SEA and you notice I don't have to put in the K. Um, uh, FlyQ is smart enough to know that there is a, uh, a, um, a, a nav aid called SCA in the Seattle area, but it knows we're taking off from an airport. And then I'm just going to put in that MSP. You don't have to put in the K again. Now, you could also, of course, put in intermediate waypoints in the quick flight planning strip if you know waypoints you want to go over or maybe stop at. But we recommend you don't do that. Let the auto router do its work because it's going to wind optimize and also fuel price optimize and recommend where to stop where your fill up will be the least expensive for you. And that's a net number. It actually takes into account, if it takes you to an airport six miles off of your direct flight plan route, 
it calculates the extra fuel you'll burn to get over there, descend, land, take off, and get back on your optimal flight plan, plan path. So um, it won't recommend you go to an airport that's out of your way unless it's, it more than saves you money by getting over to it to get take advantage of that lower fuel price. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and just for grins, go to my layers, of course, and I can turn on fuel prices whenever I want just by tapping on fuel prices. And of course, here we're seeing fuel prices around the Seattle area being advanced. FlyQ users, you guys know that green is good. Uh, we see the $4.95 up at Arlington where Steve in the online flight planner uh, was showing us some weather. Uh, we can see we don't want to go to Seattle where we're taking off. Don't fill up there, $6.15. So um, anyway, yeah, I'll go ahead and turn that layer back off for fuel prices. Now we're going to go back up to that quick flight planning strip and I'm going to go ahead and uh, put a space I, like Steve did, hit search. And what this will do, and I'm just doing it the same way because I want you to see that you're going to get the same result in FlyQ EFB as you did with FlyQ Online. Um, there are some more advanced flight planning features that are in FlyQ Online. And also creating an app um, for a, a web-based app is quite a bit less expensive and time-consuming from a development standpoint. So you will usually find more features in FlyQ Online before you'll see them in FlyQ EFB. And we came up uh, probably a year, almost a year ago now with the altitude and time sliders in FlyQ Online and with FlyQ 4.5 that we'll be previewing, uh, I think tomorrow for the first time, uh, you'll see those integrated into EFB. Uh, so uh, just a little hint that when you see cool new things in FlyQ Online, it probably means that they're coming before long to uh, EFB as well. So here we are, we get the same cool little graph where I can tap on any particular route. This is the one that was, a, there were six recent approvals of this IFR cross country route less than an hour ago. Of course, as Steve said, you, we see that the maximum cleared altitude, 33,000 feet, well, I bonanza can't get that high. But I can, and I don't want to therefore accept that 33,000 feet, or I couldn't fly it, of course. If I filed it, I wouldn't get accepted because it doesn't match my plane, et cetera. So I'm going to go ahead, and you've got multiple choices. You can customize the route. You see that blue option here in this, in this gray bar? You can do a customized route. You can just use the same waypoints along this route, the same routing, but you can say wind optimize it for my plane and my plane's capability, also fuel optimize it. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And it's going to say, uh oh, this route's above the service ceiling of 18,000. I can actually get up to 19, uh, but uh, the default in the POH is 18 for my uh, BE36, which is uh, it's, a, it's an A36, not a turbocharge. I'm going to say, go ahead and use route. Create a flight plan, flight QEFB should create a very similar, if not identical, flight plan to um, what we had uh, on flight Q online. It looks like it has. So, uh, as you know, in the nav log here, if you want to go ahead and pull up information on any of the airports along the way, you should know that you can just tap with your finger. I'm going to go down to MLP, the fifth waypoint down, and I'm going to tap on MLP. And it, it pulls up more information on that, showing me that this is um, a VOR at Mullen Pass. If I go back, it shows me other nearby things. Now, looking ac across the bottom of the window here, you see that the airports page tab at the bottom, and you see it keeps going away there. You can go into settings and turn, say, keep this on all the time if you want it to, but there's not a lot of real estate on some of the smaller minis and iPhones, so we have it go uh, disappear for you um, to give you more real estate as default. So you notice that the one on the left, airports, is blue because we're on the airports page. Well, we were on the maps uh, or in the flight planning area a minute ago looking at the nav aid. So um, I click uh, with my finger uh, it, on the button in the center of the horizontal black strip at the bottom, and you see flight plans, plans is blue. It goes away again, as I said. Now, if I take my finger and I tap on something like an airport, like 6V5 on the nav log, tap my finger on it, and now you notice that it hops me from the planning page over to the airports page. 
and it takes me, of course, to the airport that I tapped on. So now if I want to check on weather on that particular airport, I can come down here. Oh, somebody somebody uh, thought I was a real pilot. They changed my weather over to uh, raw. I like translated. I'm a wimp. I don't like to have to uh, convert in my in my head there. So um, anyway, I can go and see, the, see what the uh, weather is going to be. I can click on procedures for that airport. Uh, I can go to the AFD if I want to. And you notice it takes us right to the correct page in the AFD and the right airport on the right page. So pretty cool. Uh, NOTAMs, of course, if you want to see if there's any uh, local NOTAMs. If you go to services, we get the AOPA directory built in. So, you know, restaurants, uh, the lowest price fuel. Uh, one thing I should say on fuel is you see how it next to the fuel, if we look at Bison Municipal uh, Airport, uh, the $4.25 cell fuel, it says October 23rd. That tells you the last time that a Seattle Avionics employee talked to that, that airport or that FBO to confirm that the uh, price is accurate. Now, that's almost a month ago, so, you know, three, four weeks ago. So I might actually end up, you know, calling the phone number over on the right-hand side of the screen there just to make sure it hasn't changed. Usually, we try to keep every airport, every one of the 4,800 airports in the country updated with fuel prices every 30 days. Um, but uh, anyway... So, all right, let's go back here. Um, so we go back to the nav log again. And you should know that you can always tap on the blue, the word wind optimizer right underneath the nav log. See how it says white nav log on that tab, the wind optimizer. And we can see, and this is, I think, very important to do for advanced flight planning because uh, it's going to pick the altitudes that'll get me there the quickest with the least fuel burn, but often the differences at different altitudes aren't very significant. And by looking at this, I can see that it's gonna take me seven hours and 10 minutes total time at 17,000 feet, and I'll burn 87 gallons. Well, if I slide down a little bit, um, I can see, let's say, just for example, let's say I say, well, I don't want to have to go quite that high. Now, it's taking us this high probably because it's also getting us, um, you know, um, safely above uh, all of the terrain. And there's a lot of high mountains between here and Minneapolis. So um, I'm sure that that's why it's going so high, because I can see by looking at this that uh, I can actually get there in less time and with less fuel burn at a lower altitude. But the reason why I didn't pick those is because I'd be doing some prop sharp, sharpening, uh, driving right through mountains to be able to go at a low altitude. So, but you get the idea. You can always look at this and it's handy to see. Sometimes, um, you know, you'll have lots of clear air beneath you and see that if you drop down 5,000 feet on your service ceiling, so you don't have to climb as high, um, you may only take five minutes longer than if you go all the way up to your service ceiling of your aircraft. So that's pretty handy. Of course, on the tabs here, if you click on the weather brief, You'll automatically have the whole Lados weather brief um, here just waiting for you to scroll through and look at. If you want to um, do something with this weather brief, in the upper right-hand corner, there's a little blue square with an up arrow. That's the send to, iOS send to button. And if I tap to tap on it, it says that I can either email it to myself, I can print that weather briefing, or what I always do is see how it says save to documents? Hit save to documents. And I have a JR's docs there, you see it? I click on it, I save it, and now it's saved a copy of this weather brief into my documents. And of course, if you want to create another file folder inside of JR documents, it's just called weather briefs or flight plans or something, you could do that too. And we'll touch briefly on the document management in a few minutes. Um, so then you click on the third tab, tab over, of course, the ICAO flight plan. And you see that we've automatically filled out the IKO fleet plan with you, with all of your routing, with your estimate time or route, with all the things you need. Um, some of the things on here, if you notice, are kind of gray, and some of them are white. Anything that's white, you can tap on and you can manually override or change here in the flight plan form so you don't have to go back to the nav log. Uh, but there's some things that you'd have to create a new flight plan to actually you know, change them. So then, then you see in the upper left hand corner, there's a file button. I'm going to go ahead and tap file. All right, it's saying that we've got a problem here with uh, with uh, something on the flight plan. Uh, normally, it'll just go ahead and hit the file for you, and and you'll be good to go. But uh, um, now, one thing I want to point out is the way that I typically work 
is I will use Flight Queue online to create my flight plan a couple hours before I go, but I won't file the flight plan. Now, when I come back here to my recent flight plans, you see what I've got up at the top? I've got one that says on server. The on server one is the one that Steve created back half an hour ago. So I'll create it on FlyQ online and I won't file it. And then it, it'll end up getting saved in my recent flight plan list that I'll find on my Android phone, my iPhone, my, my Android tablet, my Macintosh and FlyQ online, my Windows 10 desktop and laptops. It all has the same recent flight plan list that are all synced through a server in the Amazon cloud. Super secure, of course. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll create a flight plan on FlyQ online. It'll automatically save it up into the cloud. Then when I get in my car and I'm driving halfway to the airport, because I've got a long drive to my airport, 45 minutes, when I'm about 15 minutes into the flight, I'll pull out my iPhone. I'll go into the recent flight plans here. I'll tap on the one, on the one that says on server, and it will automatically download it to my phone. And then I can just hit that file button. The same thing that we just saw a minute ago. I'll go to my career flight plan, see how on the ICAO flight plan tab here, you can just hit file. So in about three taps, I can pull up the flight plan I created on my Windows 10 computer in my office an hour ago on FlightQ Online. I'll go ahead and I'll pull it up on my Android phone or my iPhone while I'm buzzing to the airport and I'll hit the file button at least 30 minutes ahead of time. Then when I arrive at the airport, I'll go ahead and pull up my, my iPad, which is what you're looking at here. And I go, go back and I see to, when I go back to plans, I'll see that flight plan that I created on FlightQ Online on a Windows 10 machine that I filed on my Android or iPhone on the way. And now I'll see it at the top of the list as downloaded onto my iPad. I just tap on it. And now, of course, that flight plan pops up and I'm all ready to go. Now I'm at the plane and I'm about to take off. So I want to go ahead and get set up for flying in the cockpit. Um, in the upper right hand corner, you can see a little folded up uh, plate, a uh, little folded up map icon. Looks like a little Rand McNally folded up treasure map. If I tap on that, of course, and you should know this if you're advanced flight queue users, you tap on it when it's blue and it'll pull up the flight plan and lay it right out over on my chart. We all know that I can switch my chart from a sectional chart easily back to a low and route chart. I have dozens of different layers that I can turn on um, just by going to my layers button here. I wanna see my radar. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my METARS TAFs like Steve did. I'm gonna turn on my Windloft arrows. I'm gonna turn on AirMet SIGMATs and I see, hmm, where I'm taking off, there's a lot of AirMet Sigma junk going on along on the West Coast. So that's something that's good to know. Uh, I'm gonna go turn those off because they are pretty obstructive to my views. And I'm gonna come in and I see I've got my animated radar going. So that's helpful in giving me a little bit of a picture of an overview of where that big front is going. And I see that it's kind of moving up and out of my way. So maybe I don't need to rubber band my flight around. Um, let's see here. Um, so let's see, what else did I wanna to touch on? Um, well, let's just say that, uh, as Steve mentioned, on FlyQ Online, you can, of course, on your fly pad or on your uh, iPad while you're flying or your iPhone, you can just take your finger, touch anywhere on the magenta line at any time, wait until you get the little purple or magenta circle, and then you can drag that to wherever you want to and go ahead and drop it. When you do, it'll pull up all a list of all the things that are closest to you, and I see I've got an NDB, um, I've got Wheatland County Airport, and I can just tap anywhere in that gray bar. And now it's rerouted my flight plan and linked it there so that I'm going a little further south and out of the way to give that animated uh, precipitation a little bit more time to get out of the way. Now, on my screen, I can't see it very brightly, so I'm going to go up and touch on the little sunburst icon at the top of the screen, now right next to the lock and you see how I've got radar opacity? I'm gonna make that a little darker. And now, I don't know if you can see it, but at least on my iPad screen, it got quite a bit more, um, a little, quite a bit more opaque. Of course, if I want to uh, come, I, I could tap anywhere on my screen to get my 
page bar across the bottom back up and I'm going to go back to my nav log. I'm going to go take a look at what I have for um, an airport that I maybe want to add some fuel at. Whoops, I'm sorry, touched the wrong thing here. I'm going to want to say edit. And then I can go ahead and take a look at information on these. I can see that that one's a waypoint. I'm clicking on the little eye off on the right hand side. So I can go to an airport like 6V5, tap the eye for that. And I see this is a fuel stop. I can change my layover time if I want to do, because I'm going to maybe go for lunch and maybe instead of 45 minute layover time, I want uh, an hour and 15 minutes, or maybe I only want 20 minutes because I'm going to try to hurry up and get back out of there. Um, so you get the idea on that. Um, let's see. Let's go ahead and fire up the... Um, so of course, you can also move around waypoints. You can delete waypoints on the nav log or when we go back to the map tab, let's say I want to get rid of that waypoint that I added down here graphically by rubber banding down. If I just touch and touch it with my finger and hold, it will pull it back up and it'll say Wheatland County. Do you want to delete it? And you just tap on it. And I say delete. And now you see how that my route that I rubber banded down to Wheatland is no longer going to Wheatlands and I'm back to where I was. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to turn off the animated radar. Gets a little bit busy. I'm going to turn on um, some clouds, satellite layers, so I can see where I've got clouds to deal with. And now because a low and route chart is white and clouds are kind of gray and white, I'm going to go ahead and switch back over to a sectional chart that more easily shows me where my visible, see there we can see there's a big hole in Eastern Washington. I can see I'm gonna have some nice clear weather along there. And then I'm going back into some, some kind of crummy weather. And we, uh, I'm gonna, in that right now, and then we go to the upper right hand corner of FlyQ EFB. You know that there are five little icons up there that are um, basically affiliated with flying with portable GPSs or ADSB receivers. I'm gonna tap my finger on those five little bars that pulls up the status indicator for ADSB or portable GPSs. Um, then I've got my tab bars, I'm sure on the left-hand side, I'm sure you're familiar with this. This is how you turn on the simulator. And so I'm gonna go ahead and tap simulator on, on my flight plan. And then I tap off somewhere and now I'm back taking off from pain uh, from SeaTac, where I'm taking off from. I've got my METAR circles on. I see that it's low or in a marginal VFR. Uh, yellow is marginal. Green, of course, is VFR and red is IMC. So I can see that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and tap on this again and I'm going to drag my position along. Let's go jump halfway down our route out to Minneapolis. And now, of course, I can go ahead and play with this at home without burning fuel and get to know some of these more advanced features more easily. Now, as you know, as advanced users, in the upper left-hand corner, you can tap the little two square white boxes that are together. That's the split screen button. When I tap with my finger, it turns blue, indicating that it's been activated. So now we're in split screen view, and I can put two things, whatever I want, on, on both the right and the left side. Um, because we're flying along and uh, we're, we're flying in some clouds here, I see that I've got uh, IFR. Now, this is an IFR flight plan that I created and filed, and so that's what I've opened, and that's what I'm flying on this IFR flight plan. I'm going to go ahead and uh, come back to um, on the left-hand window. I'm going to go ahead, and the fourth button down on the vertical nav bar is a little three-dimensional white cube. That, as you know, is how you click the button to go into 3D synthetic vision mode. Now I can go to the layers for that window, which of course I tap my finger right there in the layers and I can say, I also want obstacles and TAWS turned on. And I tap off and now those are on. Now I'm gonna see, now we're out in the middle of uh, the kind of the high prairies there, uh, out in the middle of the country. So we don't have a lot of mountains right now. Um, let's go ahead and drag our position ahead 
and see if we can, or maybe I'll go back a little, try to find some place where I've got a little more exciting mountains to show you. There we go. All right, so now I've drug it back to a place and I can see, where are we here? I'm gonna go ahead and zoom in. Uh, Sealy Lake, Black Rock Canyon, what lake or Flathead Lake. So we're over there by Idaho heading into Wyoming, it looks like. What's our city here? Great Falls. Of course, another great way to figure out where you are at any point in time is if you tap in either window and you go to airports, it's going to always show you your list of your nearest airports. This is important to know because at any time you're flying along and you might feel a little uncomfortable or you get a little hiccup in your engine running smoothly because there's a little maybe water in the gas or, uh, you know, um, you know, you get nervous instrument conditions, whatever. Anytime you tip, tip, click on or tap on to select the airport list, the nearest airport's always at the top. So you're always just two taps away from being able to do a direct to whatever your nearest airport is, regardless of where you are. It doesn't have to be on the map. Like right now I'm off here going, hmm, where am I? I don't know. Well, to recenter yourself, go to the right window, hit the little gun sight, the second icon down on the vertical nav bar, tap it once, it'll recenter you, hit it a second time and it zooms into sectional range. Now I'm gonna again, push it off. Uh-oh, I'm down in maybe Colorado now. I'm totally lost. Just hit that little round gun sight twice and boom, you're centered. Now I see that Sealy Lake's my nearest airport. I could just hit a direct to and it would take me off my flight plan line and take me direct to my nearest airport if I had to get down quickly. Um, let's see, where was I now? We were back here on the left-hand side. We went to, um, we were on the map view and of course we we're in synthetic vision view. So now I can see that we're flying over the mountains. You're gonna see rivers and lakes and things. You're gonna see obstacles. If there's a runway we fly over, um, you'll see the actual paved runway. You'll see the runway heading numbers down there. You do have to have high res terrain, however, downloaded to be able to see that kind of detail. So how do you find that? You go to the data manager and as an advanced user, I know you know already that going to the center of the black horizontal strip at the top, you've got the white circle with the black down arrow, you just tap it and up comes the data manager. Now I created this flight plan and it looks like I'm just barely skimming the corner of North Dakota. Um, so I don't technically, the pre-flight checklist, which I'll show you how to run manually in just a second, didn't pick up North Dakota, but I can tap on it right now before I take off and hit update now and I can get make sure all my plates and charts of all types and all the nav data I might need for that airport or that state is on board my iPad saved to the hard drive so that if I'm up too high to get uh, either cell towers or Wi-Fi or anything, I'll have what I need. Um, now I was gonna jump over here to the chart data manager and show you if you scroll down, you can see, see high resolution terrain in the middle of the screen there. You need to make sure that's on if you wanna make sure that you get all of the um, you know, high res stuff in synthetic vision. I think by default now we leave that off so that your downloads aren't quite as uh, big or take as long, conserve your uh, cell data and things like that. But I recommend you turn that on if you're especially flying IMC. Um, I use synthetic vision when I'm flying down valleys and stuff because you may not be able to see the cumulative granite on the left and right side of you looking out your window, but you want to be able to see it in your 2D view. So um, let's go ahead and I'll get out of the data manager. It's closing that down. Here I am with the synthetic view. Um, and of course, now uh, let's see, what else did we want to... Uh, talk to do here. I'm going to go back to single screen mode and look at, now how do you switch from, two, from 3D to 2D? That little 3D cube is a three function button. So when you click it once, it takes you to 2D or top down view. And I've got my clouds on, so it looks a little smoky. I'll turn those off. There I am flying along. Now, if I hit that 3D cube a second time, it takes me into synthetic vision mode. There I am flying right over the mountains. And I've got TAS turned on, but I'm too low, I'm too high to have the mountain show up red. 
if we were within um, 500 feet of them, they'd be red. If we were within 1,000 feet, they'd be yellow. We're safely above them, so you don't see that right now. But uh, if I click on that 3D cube a third time, it takes me into synthetic, it takes me into, I'm sorry, augmented reality mode. And I can hold my iPad or my iPhone up. Oh, there's Steve out the window of my office. <laughs> now, obviously, this isn't very realistic. If I were looking out the windshield of the aircraft, that I would see those little signposts pointing exactly, that the tip of the point would be pointing exactly where the runway is off in the distance. And if you're flying along an IMC and it's total white out out your window, this could be very handy to pick up. And maybe you've got your iPad on your lap and, or in a yoke mount or something and you can't pick that up. You can go ahead and just fire up FlyQ EFB on your iPhone and tap on, <laughs> Steve knows what we're doing. And uh, you can go ahead and uh, you know just aim your iPhone out the window and look around and even though it's dark at night or it's all gray because you're IMC, you can go ahead and see uh, different airports that are around you and of course the direction you're heading and things. If you tap on one of those signposts like 3U7, I'm gonna touch my finger on it, it takes me right to the airport page for that particular airport. I've got the airport diagram. I've got a Google satellite image. I've got weather, instrument procedures, airport, you know, Air Force direct, airport directory, um, and all those kinds of things. So, um, all right. So now I'll go back again to my map page at the bottom. You see how maps is highlighted. And now I'm going to hit that 3D cube to toggle me back to 2D view. Now I'm going to zoom out a little and I'm going to say that uh, let's say I'm flying along and let's say they tell me that uh, because of really bad low weather here, they want me to go ahead and um, ATC may say, hey, we want you to go ahead and um, intercept an intersection fly. They're going to may say turn left and I'm sure you've had this happen. Turn left, I'm gonna go switch this back to a low and route chart. And they may say, fly direct to um, the Roscoe Waypoint, in which case, of course, I can go ahead and tap on it. It pulls up Roscoe and I could just hit direct to, or I can say, add it to my flight plan. You see how the second little black box in is plus FP? I'm going to go ahead and say plus FP, and it's going to say, where do I want to add that? And I wasn't paying a lot of attention here, so I'm going to want to do it before, before MLS, miles, I think it's miles city. So if I'm here, they're going to tell me to proceed direct to Roscoe. I tap on it. Oh, it's not going to pop up. What's the problem here? There we go. It pops up. And that's a... Uh, uh, I, I tap on it. I'm sorry. Go to fixes. There's Roscoe. I say add to flight plan and I want to add it right before... MLS, and now you see how it automatically added that. So you can go ahead and do that. Now you could also use a quick flight planning strip. You could go up to search for airports, so or you could say, I want the V536 radial, and you could put in the intercept of another radial, and a lot of your intersections, of course, are defined by, by uh, a certain degree radial off of a particular uh, VOR. So you can do it that way, or you can say the intersection of V120 and V536. Just type those in with a slash in the quick flight planning strip. It'll pull up that point and you just say direct to it. So that could be pretty handy too. Um, let's see here, what else? Um, oh yeah, let's say that we're coming along. We wanna go ahead and we wanna pick an arrival procedure. So we're gonna to go to the airport we're headed to, and let's say we decide we wanna add an arrival. Right now I'm flying in here, and you see how I'm gonna come into Torgi. 
Now, just for fun, I'm going to go ahead and fly our plane to get myself. I'm not quite far enough. I'm just sliding the position on route to get us into the vicinity of the MSP airport. And now you can see where we are. So now what I can do is I can go to my my MSP is my landing airport. There's multiple ways I can get there. I can go to the airport tab at the bottom, the airport page, and I can uh, see it in my nearest list and click on it there. Or I could go up to my quick flight planning strip and just type in MSP in the quick flight planning strip. That'll pull up the airport box. Or I can go ahead and just double tap on it right on the map. So three or four different ways to pretty quickly in just a click or two get to that information. So I pull up uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and there are four little black boxes on KMSP. The third one in is a little, looks like a piece of paper with folded ear. That's instrument approach procedures. So I say, take me to my instrument approach procedures. Now, this is the actual graphical plate viewer. I can take my finger and I can swipe across these. Pretty cool. Now I'm going to go to my split screen view by hitting that little square in the upper left hand corner to go into split screen mode. And now I'm going to go ahead and, oops, hit the wrong one there. So I'm going to go ahead and go back over here to MSP and I'm going to double click on it, go to those instrument approach plates. You see how I've got the viewer here. Now I'm going to go to my map over here on the left side. This is one of the real advantages of a split screen mode. You can put whatever you want on either side. Now most of the big competitors out there, Garmin Pilot and Vorflight, will allow you to do split screen, but none of them will let you put whatever you want, whatever screen in whatever order. So that's pretty cool. And of course, if you just rotate your iPad, it'll automatically change them around from landscape to portrait just by rotating. Alrighty, now as I, I'm gonna go ahead and switch my chart in the left-hand window by tapping on layers and going back to sectional because my approach plate's gonna show up better. So I'm gonna, over on the right-hand window, where I've got my approach plate, you see there's a little gray square with that folded up map icon uh, about two thirds of the way up the right side of the approach plate. When you tap that, it says, lay my approach plate over my sectional or my low and route, whatever I have selected in the other window. Now you notice that it's semi-transparent. We do that so that you can see it over the, see the approach plate over the top of your sectional low and route or high and route or whatever you want, TAC, whatever. But we make it semi-transparent so if there's a VFR reporting station underneath, it's only on the sectional, not on the plate, you'll be able to see that. But a lot of people say that's too distracting, John. So I go up to the horizontal nav bar at the top of FlyQ where that little sun icon is, and I say change my procedure opacity to solid. Now I can see that plate and it's not distracting. Now I can't see through it to what's underneath, but you get the idea. Now if I decide, okay, well, that's not the approach plate I want. I mean, you can flip on the right-hand side, and as you flip, look what happens on the left-hand side. Well, that's not the approach I want because it's coming from a totally wrong side. It's coming, it's coming from the east and I'm flying in from the west. Same thing with that one. So I'm not going to want that one. Now, here's one that may be, yeah, this is an ILS. So I know that the, there's some uh, IFR conditions in the vicinity around me. So maybe I want this one. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, go ahead and go back to single screen mode. And now I've got that instrument approach plate on my screen. And I'm going to go ahead and say, for initial approach fix, because of the direction I'm coming from, I know that I'm going to want to jump onto the localizer at Hamel. So I rubber band my flight plan line over. And I drop it onto my waypoint. And it says, what were you trying to get to? And I say, I'm trying to get to Hamel. So you tap on it, now you're locked. And if you go back to your flight plan nav log, go to the bottom, we see that Hamel's now been added. 
Okay, so now I've got the proper instrument approach fix for my um, approach into uh, MSP. Now let's say, well, you know, I want a star. All we've got to do is go back to Minneapolis by double tapping it on the map, or of course, typing in MSP in the quick flight planning strip at the upper left-hand corner, or tapping on the airport's list and tapping my finger on MSP. All of them will bring up, bring me to the same place right here. I did the one with the least amount of clicks, of course, just a single double click on the uh, airport on the map. Now I go back to the approach plates, remember that viewer. Now I don't wanna flip through them, I wanna go straight to my list. So over on the left, the vertical nav bar, you can see three little lines stacked. That's how you get to your list. Now you don't have to flip through by you know one at a time, all the different approaches and, and arrivals and things like that. You can come down here and say, I want to go down and look at my arrivals. Now I'm going to say, hmm, which one do I want, I wonder? I'm not quite sure. I'm going to click on my Baney 3 arrival. And of course, I see it on my screen. But what I want to do is go back into my split screen mode. where I can see what I, direction I'm coming from and I can see my Bain, my uh, Baney 3 arrival and I can say, eh, coming from the west, I'm probably not gonna want that one. Uh, how about this one? Nope, that one's not the right direction either. Uh, oh, hey, look, here's one coming in from, I see, let's zoom in here and see if we've got Hamill, Badger Green Bay. Minneapolis, oh, nope, that's an arrival coming in from, that's the wrong side as well. Um, Fargo, this one looks like it might be coming in from the right side, the correct side. Okay, I'm not gonna take any more time here. You get the idea, you can go ahead and take a look at them. Pretty soon, these will actually be able to overlay on your route so you can actually see them on your main map. But for right now, you'd have to flip through and kind of pick the one you want. You see in the upper right-hand corner there, it says plus flight plan. When you tap on it, it says, where do you think you'd want to go? Which transition do you want? I'm probably going to want to go to Fargo. Which entry? I'm going to pick golf, and I'm going to say, add that to my flight plan. And now, if I go back to single screen mode, I not only have got it added to my nav log, but you see how on the nav log I have golf, it says the go for one star or arrival, and then I go to GEP, and then I go to Vikes. So now I've got all the waypoints for my star and my transition that I selected all spilled into my nav log automatically. But also, if I go back to my map page, I see how it took me up to golf. Now I can see, by looking at this now that eh, I should have done the transition that jumps me on at GEP. So I could go ahead and just double click on that and delete the waypoint. And now I'm direct GEP. And of course, if I go back to my nav log, I'll see that now the other waypoint is now gone. Um, now, of course, you're talking to ATC and you're gonna, you know, you're gonna get cleared and you're gonna, you know, make the make make the changes, uh, you know, get the changes approved and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, anyway, so you get the idea there. So that's adding instrument approach plates, selecting them, adding them onto their map, selecting your initial approach fix. It's picking which star, uh, DP, departure procedure, sitter star that you want, how to spill all the waypoints automatically into your nav log. Um, so that's helpful. Now, while we're flying a couple other things, everybody should know about the lock button. Um, I'll go ahead and go into split screen mode and put whatever I want on my screen. For example, I maybe will go to my map here on my right-hand screen and I'll say I want that synthetic vision mode because I want to make sure I'm staying clear of mountains and obstacles um, in my right window. And then I want to be able to see in my left window I'm going to go slide my position and the GPS a little bit closer to landing. Turn on those obstacles and taws. So now as we come in, I don't know if you can see in the right-hand window, but I can see little white 
kind of like look like stars off in the distance. We're still high enough up. We're at 14,000 feet and descending as we head to GEP, as we can see on the left-hand side. But uh, we're starting to see some obstacles, some towers or something, actually in the synthetic vision view off to the right. The uh, high in the sky purple boxes, of course, are uh, following the right vertical descent speed to get us down to GEP, so we arrive you know, at the right place at the right time. Um, hey, that reminds me of another thing that I should show you. Let's say that you think, boy, it would sure be nice to have, um, you see how at the top of the right-hand window we have altitude, ground speed, and track. Those are our gauges. If you want to switch those, you just touch one of them, hold it with your finger, And it pops up a list of about 35 Garmin G1000 GPS tags that we can switch it to. So I could go ahead and switch it to AGL, for example, if I wanted to. But let's say I don't want to get rid of my altitude and, G and ground speed. I think those are important in my track and my next waypoint. Those are all important to keep on my screen to the right. I can go to the left window, and on the vertical nav bar in the lower left, the bottom icon looks like a little gauge. See the little... You tap your finger and activate it. Guess what? Now I've turned on a bunch of more um, gauges across the top of the left side. So now I can go ahead, touch on ground speed, and I can say on this window, I'm fine with that being AGL because that's valuable instead of my altitude. And I can go ahead and go on the altitude and say, I want my vertical speed required. So right now I can see that I need 772 vertical speed feet per minute descent rate on the path I'm on to arrive half a mile half a mile out from the airport at my at, at uh, you know TPA altitude, um, so that's kind of handy to be able to uh, switch those. Um, now I set my screen up like this, and when I'm getting in close to an approach, I don't want to be playing with my iPad. So what I do is I go up to the lock icon, and you see how it's gone from white to blue. Now, whether I rotate my iPad, I set it on the seat, I bump my hand on it, no matter what you do, it's locked, and it'll always be like this, ready for you, when on your short approach, you want to pick it up and take a peek at it, make sure you're still in the highway and sky boxes, because you don't believe your localizer and glide slope that you're shooting in your plane because you can't see anything out the window and you want a, you know, a second verification or something like that. So uh, that's what the lock does, can be super valuable. Um, oh, I talked to you about the pre-flight planning checklist. When you create a flight plan before you take off, you see the little airplane taking off right next to the downloads, the chart data download manager button at the top. If you tap that little white airplane taking off before you leave, it'll automatically do your pre-flight checklist. And I apologize, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit here, uh, showing you some in-flight and some things that I guess I should have remembered when we were doing the pre-flight planning part. But you want to make sure before you take off that you've downloaded and have everything you need. And this flight, even IFR, loan route charts, and terminal procedures, of course, you want to have on your iPad and saved on the hard drive so that there's nothing you might want to refer to that isn't already saved. Um, and, of course, we always download your METARS, TAFs, winds aloft, all that kind of information, and save it to your hard drive for every hour, hour by hour, for 12 hours into the future. So that even when you're up flying, if you can stay up there for 12 hours, you can go tap on a TAF, and you're going to see the TAF for the current hour as it was downloaded and saved back three, four hours ago before you took off. If you have an ADSB receiver, of course, then your weather would be coming live. Uh, if you can, please join us for our... Um, our very exciting, uh, our very exciting um, webinar. I believe the first one's tomorrow on the new 4.5 version of Flight QEFB. We're taking the number of weather layers, and I'll go ahead and tap on with the weather layers here. You see how uh, in uh, on the uh, layers pop up in the upper right-hand corner. You've got the weather category. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different weather layers. I think we're going to 20 or 21, so we're tripling the number of weather layers. And unlike uh, the other guys with the uh, no name to be mentioned, uh, uh, the EFB that can't be mentioned uh, app, um, we don't make you turn certain layers off to turn other layers on. We actually have three times as many layers as four, well, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, uh, some of our competitors. And uh, you can turn on any and all combinations and uh, we've got the horsepower built into our 3D charting engine 
to be able to um, you know handle that. So you're not limited by what you how many layers you can turn on or turn off. You can you know clutter up the screen as much as you want to your heart's content, which is important I think because you're the PIC, you should be able to do it and see it how you want, not how somebody else thinks you should want it. Um, let's see what else. Um, uh, nighttime mode, of course, is pretty self-explanatory. That's not really a very advanced feature. You just, I'll go back to a full screen, um, the single screen mode, and then I'll go ahead and hit the nighttime button, which is right up, right next to the settings, the little gear wheel at the t center top. Now, you notice something pretty cool, unlike a lot of our competition. They reverse all colors. They take any color and reverse it to the opposite, um, you know, the, the shade of gray. Uh, what we do is we take all white, turn it black, black and turn it white, shades of gray to different shades of gray. But we keep your colors so that if you come in here and you say, I want to see my, rad my next rad radar. Whoops. Nah. Turn on animated radar loop here and see if that, there we go. You can tell by, as you zoom in, your VTAR TAF circles stay the correct color, green being VFR, yellow at marginal, and red IMC. Uh, here's my, my TAS view. There's my terrain. You can see that it's yellow, showing that we're 1,000 feet from terrain, or red, we're only a few hundred feet from terrain, less than 500. Or, of course, we can come up here to the animated next red radar, and, of course, that's the correct colors going all the way even up into Canada. You notice we've got all our wind arrows with the uh, winds aloft. And of course, these are all automatically matched to the altitude you're flying at. With version 4.5, you're going to have an altitude slider on the right-hand side so you can drag it up and down at any time to see what the winds are above and below you as well. Oh, that reminds me, one of my favorite features in FlyQ, and one of the things when I'm flying cross-country like this, I'll turn off our night mode. Go back here, we're flying along. Um, I'm gonna go into split screen mode. And on my left-hand window here, I'm gonna go back to my weather tab and I'm gonna click on the winds tool. And as I'm flying on the right-hand side, I see at all times as I'm flying, the altitude I'm at right now, and you can see if you look in the right-hand window, we're split screen, right? So look at the right window, go up to the top, you see altitude is 73.27. We're descending down to that GEP, way, GEP waypoint we're headed to. But the, um, the uh, um, altitude um, is indicated on the bar graph on the left by the horizontal gray bar showing us that we're at 7,000 feet and we're going down. So right now you can see that we have a about a between 11 and 15 knot tailwind. And if we look at the little uh, white airplane in the left window, it says we have a 16 knot left quartering tailwind helping to push us along. The bar graph shows you how much of that actually speeds you along the ground. So we're gonna be picking up 11 knots at 6,000 feet right now as we're headed in. I leave this up, the wind tool up, all the times I'm flying cross country so that I can see if I go up or down, I can pick up another five or 10 knots in ground speed at any point in time. Um, let's see, we talked about the, the manager, the pre-flight check. Um, oh, the, the, the document manager. Uh, we didn't do that. So let's real quick talk about the document manager for advanced features. That's very important. You're, if you um, pull up the page bar at the bottom, you see all the way to the right, documents. I'm going to tap on it, and you've got your document manager over here. Now, this is really awesome and very powerful because you can put an unlimited number of documents and save them on the hard drive of your iPad. So all these right here have been downloaded from somewhere else, and they're on my hard drive so that I can tap on it, pull it up, and access it. Um, at any time. Now, there's always going to be the Seattle Advanced Pilot's Guide, of course. You tap on it, and you definitely want that on your iPad because if you want to look something up, let's say you're cruising along with your flight director on your autopilot and you're going across country and you got some time, you might want to pop over here and take a peek if you got somebody in the right seat to be watching out for you, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, um, so, anyway, here's your pilot's guide. You can go ahead and jump to a particular page if you want to. Um, and uh, 
So um, anyway, so that's one of your documents, of course. I'm going to say done and go back to that document manager. Um, now you can also create file folders and you can put file folders inside of file folders. You remember when I pulled up my weather briefing for this flight that I created and filed, um, I saved it into my JR's doc. So I'm going to tap on the file folder and see where it says WF brief. There's the flight plan. Um, there, there's the uh, weather briefing associated with flight plan that I saved and it's right there where I can always refer to it sometime in the future. Now, if you want to add documents, of course, at any time, you just go to the upper right-hand corner of the document manager. There's a little plus sign. Say, I want to add. What do you want to add? Do you want to create a folder or do you want to create a document? I'm going to add a document. And on in the EFB for you, you won't have all these categories because I've created some of my own, including um, a, a, a replica file folder for the Piper Archer that Seattle Avionics used to own until recently. And that's our tail number for that. If I tap on it, it shows me the documents I have there. Um, but if I want to go to FAA IFR charts, for example, I can scroll through the list and you can see the ones that I have already downloaded that are in my document manager, saved on the hard drive of my iPad or iPhone or both, or my hard drive of like you online if I'm on a laptop or a Mac or desktop. Um, if I want to add one, I just tap right on it. See how it puts a check there on IFR planning chart, the yellow has a check on it, and then I just say add in the upper right hand corner. It'll download that and add it to the, uh, and this one's a pretty quick one, so I'll say add. It says it confirms. Do you want to add it to your document manager? Yes, I do. Now it goes away. I wait just a minute, and boing, there it shows up in the list. So that was flight planning chart east. You see it's got a picture of a camera on it, and when I tap on it, it pulls it up. And there's my IFR flight planning chart for the east. Now, one of the things that's really cool, too, is anything you download that's relatively new will have a little new on it. The little green ball in the upper left-hand corner of each document tells you that, um, that it is current. It's matched up with the current um, copy of wherever you got it. So... When you go to add a document and you say add a document and you go to, let's say now the FAA chart supplements, you've got literally dozens to choose from. You scroll through here. It's going to download it from the source at the FAA's site, put a copy on your iPad, and then keep it current. So if they then take that East Central A um, Airport Facility Directory and they swap it out, then... Um, the most current one that they have put on their server stays tied to yours on your iPad. And I'm going to say cancel here. And uh, that way, all your little, the little green balls will stay green. If uh, you, for some reason, weren't able to download it and, and the newer one was put up, it'll say, it'll turn yellow telling you that you don't have it, whatever. All right. Well, listen, I've kept everyone way beyond what we're supposed to. I'm way over my time. Uh, sorry about that. I hope that this has been valuable. 